The Lord Jesus had a tender side and a tough side. And he saved his harshest words for the most religious, denominationally minded leaders of his day. There were two major denominations, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They both treasured their traditions, bragged about their bureaucracy, crowed about their conservatism. And yet on one particular occasion, he made one of the most damning, rebuking statements he ever made to anyone when he said this to some Sadducees. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. It's one thing to be ignorant of the word of God. It's another thing to ignore the power of God. If there's ever been a time when our pastors and our churches and our seminaries and our missionaries and our denomination ever desperately needed the power of God, that time is now. Never before in our nation's history have we had more productive churches, more prosperous churches, more popular churches. But can we honestly say compared to the church at Pentecost, we have powerful churches? Dr. A.W. Tozer, who knew as much about God and revival as anyone, poignantly said this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. But if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would have stopped and everybody would have known the difference. The church today is bigger, richer, sleeker, slicker than it's ever been. We have mastered the marketing of the church. We have transformed technology in the church. And yet we look outside the church and we see the banks of America are overflowing with the waters of wickedness. We desperately need a spiritual awakening. But without the power of God, a spiritual awakening is just a pipe dream. Spiritual awakening will not come to America until revival comes to the church. And revival will not come to the church until the power of God falls on the church. So I just want to remind us, we need God's power working in us. After the temptation, after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, we're told in Luke, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Even the Son of God would not get up out of the ground from his sleep the night before until he knew he was filled with the Spirit of God, and neither should we. We need God's power witnessing through us. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let us never forget, it is the Spirit of God working through the saints of God that brings sinners to God. And then finally, we need God's power walking before us. Our president is right. We worship a God, Paul said, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is his work within us. Now let me just be honest. I get it. I understand. You say, James, the waters of wickedness in this land are as deep as they've ever been. Yes, they are. You say, James, the levels of lukewarmness in our churches are as high as they've ever been. Yes, they are. But I still believe we can have a spiritual awakening. And I still believe that we can experience revival because I believe in the power of God. God is not old. God is not sick. God is not retired. And God is not dead. God is not impotent, God is omnipotent, and there is nothing too difficult for him. So I close with this. The people of Israel had been three days without water. They were dirty, they were dry, they were desperate, and they were dying. And all they had to drink were the undrinkable, bitter waters of Marah. And God said to Moses, Moses, take a stick and throw it into the water. And Moses did that, and those waters turned as sweet as sugar. 
that God is alive and well. And that God still specializes in taking an old rugged cross, throwing it into the waters of wickedness, and turning them into rivers of revival. God, God is up to the task of doing it if we are up to the task of believing it and receiving it. Let's pray together. As we bow before the Father tonight, just as you're sitting in your chair tonight, surrender completely to Jesus. Say, Lord, I surrender my all. Tell him that tonight. Tell him I give you all my all my bad, all my stuff that I'm packing that's not healthy. I surrender to your Lordship. I give you my problems. I surrender my church, my family, my ministry. everything as you surrender to him ask him for a fresh anointing on your life ask him for a fresh anointing on your ministry When you enter that pulpit this coming Sunday or you enter your church, everything looks differently. And when you explode with worship and explode with leadership and explode with preaching the Word, the people will look at you and say, Oh, my soul, what happened to our preacher? What happened to Deacon so-and-so? What, what happened to her over here? What is she doing? She... She's a new woman. God got a hold of her. Ask him for fresh fire in your church. Oh, my church needs fresh fire from heaven. What about yours? Fresh anointing on our preaching. And let's tell him tonight, we believe in your power. Far too long, the world has seen what man can do. Now's the time the world gets to see what God can do. Give us fresh power, fresh filling, fresh anointing. Because the heart of God is for his people to walk in life. That's why the church needs revival. Lord, as your messenger comes, it's time for revival in the church. And all God's people said, Amen. It's time for revival in our churches. The book of Acts tells us, I believe, what the church ought to be. We read in Acts 4, 31, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. In three centuries, these Christians conquered the greatest empire, the Roman Empire,
And you look at them and you say, how in the world can a ragtag group of fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, commoners turn their world upside down in such a short time? They had a holy fire that James talked about that was burning in their souls and they could not be extinguished. The legalism of Judaism could not extinguish that fire. The philosophies of Greece could not extinguish that fire. The immorality of Rome could not extinguish that fire. In Acts 3, Peter and John had gone to pray and they saw a lame man. He wanted some alms. Peter said, I don't have any money, but I have something better than that. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And they went into the temple, walking, leaping, praising God. They came out. Peter preached, repent and return that your sins may be wiped away. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. People got saved, but the Jewish leaders got mad. They arrested them. And in Acts 4, the Bible says they threatened them. But they said, if it's right to obey you rather than God, you be the judge. But as for us, we will not stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And oh, by the way, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. And they went back after they were released and they gathered to pray. And they focused on th three things, prayer, God's power, and proclamation. If we want revival, we're going to have to focus on prayer. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. I want to tell you, there's some people in this room, including myself, God needs to shake us. God needs to shake our churches. God needs to shake our denomination. They prayed and God shook them. They had seen Jesus pray. They knew that he prayed and they said, you know, if Jesus needs to pray, we need to pray. But they didn't just pray. They prayed until the power of God was upon them. And that's a different story. You can pray, but when you pray through, God comes on you in power. And if we want revival, we don't just focus on prayer. We focus on the power of God. It says when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you, brethren, God's work requires God's power. It's not by might, not by power, not by any of our stuff, but it is by the Spirit of the living God. God doesn't need your brains, your brawn, or your bucks. He doesn't need your mind, your might, or your money. He just wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and then use you for His glory. We're not smart enough. We're not wealthy enough. We're not strong enough. We need the power of God. They focused on prayer. They focused on power. And once they prayed and the Spirit of God came down upon them and filled them, then they focused on proclamation. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. In my quiet time, I'm praying for God to raise up a new generation of Wesley brothers. I'm praying for God to raise up some more Whitfield, some more Edwards, some more Asbury's. I'm praying for God to raise up some people who will travel. And while they travel, they will travail and they will preach the word of God in season and out of season, in churches and outdoors to where people won't go to church, but they'll bring the church to them and they'll share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, Dr. Fish used to say, if you want to serve Jesus, you cannot serve Jesus with a zipped lip. Jesus Christ, if he is in your heart, he will come out of your mouth. We need to tell people about Jesus Christ. Proclamation. I'll tell you what we need. We need a church 
that is praying, that is full of the Holy Ghost power, and that is proclaiming the gospel. We don't need a higher minimum wage. We don't need just a stronger economy. We don't need gay rights. We need a church on fire for the living God. And we need for the church to wake up and say, we're going to pray until the power falls. And when the power falls, we're going to tell people about Jesus and proclaim that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh God, revive your church. And church, we bow together right where we are, and we pray for revival in the church. And in this moment, there will be several prayers uttered about specifics about revival, groups that we pray for. And right now, all of us in this room, all of us watching on television, all who are listening on the radio, and all of you that are on the web, you join us in agreement. As the church prays, we pray in agreement. Father, I thank you so very much that I'm redeemed. But Father, I thank you so very much that you reached down and called me out to be a man of God. Father, I pray for pastors all across Southern Baptist life and around the world, regardless of what denomination they may be labeled by. Father, I pray that you will give us a fresh anointing. And Father, I pray more than anything that you'll touch our lives. Let us know it's a new day and you're bringing about a new work. Let it be a great spiritual awakening. But Father, I pray that, Lord, where there's sin, I pray that we'll repent. And Father, I pray that there will be a, a renewed spirit within us to have a desire and a passion, not for the world, but Father, for your word. Lord, I pray for revival to be in the, in the pew, but Lord, let it begin in the pulpit. Lord, would you revive your men. Lord, I pray that as we stand, let us preach with a new anointing. And Father, I thank you for the revival that you're going to bring. Yes, amen. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity just to be a pastor's wife. Father, I thank and pray that, Lord, that's such a special calling. But, Lord, it's not our husband's calling as well. We have that calling. I pray that, Lord, we will take that so serious, Father. I pray right now that there will just be revival in our hearts, Father. And we know that it just a, starts with our relationship with you. I just pray that that, Father, our prayer life will be stronger than it's ever been. I pray that our study in your word will be as strong as it's ever been. And, Father, I just pray that you'll take us, and, Father, make us radiant from the inside out. Let us have vibrant relationships with you. So, Father, that people that we come across, they will have the opportunity to see you in us. And, Father, I just pray that you'll take the time, Father, just to allow us to know and notice, Father, that we, you give us the power, Father, to do great things. And Lord, we just pray that many lives will be touched and changed because of our vibrant walk as a pastor's wife. Lord, let us love on people, let us serve people, and let us bring people to you. Oh, Father, your pastors are your beating heart, the heart of the body of Christ, but we who are not pastors are every other part of the body. And Father, you need arms and legs and hands, you need feet. You need every other thing, and we beg you to call us not just to repent, but to act, to lead your businesses, to invent great cures, to change the world for you, to make everything yours, because it is all yours, and we love you, and we praise you. Amen. Lord Jesus, we pray today for every elementary, middle school, junior high, high school, collegiate, and graduate student in our churches. We pray you'd capture their hearts and their desires and their attention. Holy Spirit, we pray for you to move in their lives. We pray that you would revive student ministries, that you would revive churches that would go after students and kids. Father, we pray that you would help them to walk, not just with the sword of the Spirit, but you would give them the shield of faith. We pray for students that you would help them to believe, not just in you, but believe you yes. and walk with you. We pray for revival among students. Amen. Father, our families are disintegrating. Right before our eyes, 
We're seeing men and women in our own churches falling apart. The divorce rate among Christians is the same as it is among the secular world. And from pulpit to pew, we must do everything we possibly can to reach the family tonight. Yes. Father, I pray for the women of our churches that we will be obedient to your word. Yes. Lord, that we would respect and submit to our husbands. That we would encourage our children and be loving mothers. And, oh, Father, I pray that our homes will be a shining light of your love in this dark world. In Jesus' name. Father, we come tonight humbly, yet with a bold request that you would pour out your spirit and power among men, that your men might be revived beginning yes. right now in this very day, this very hour. Father, revive us that we might be the fathers and the husbands you've called us to be. Revive us that we might be the leaders in our churches you've called us to be. Revive us that we might be the leaders in our community, that there might be a standard of hope Jesus yes. Christ, that we would keep high and lift it up. In Jesus' name. Yes. God, our churches are in a desperate state. And to be revived, we must change, Lord. Make our churches willing to change, God. Make us revivable. Lord, let our churches no longer be about our preferences and our programs and our pride, but let us be about your presence and your power again, O oh great King. Revive your church, Jesus. We ask in Christ's name. Yes, Lord, do it. Father, you've given us so many tools, the ministries and the lives of our churches, and we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would fall in such a way that we would not even recognize them anymore that we just see what you're doing through this, and the Lord, that revival, that we might have a new passion for you through all the ministries, large and small, in the life of our church. And we'll give you all of the honor and the glory in the blessed name of Jesus, we do pray. We pray, God, for leaders across the Southern Baptist Convention. We've walked with pride and self-sufficiency. Father, we need to humble ourselves. We cannot lead people where we ourselves will not go. Father, forgive us. We've been swift to speak and slow to hear, quick to criticize and slow to forgive. God, forgive us. Renew a right spirit within us. Fill our leaders with vision and courage that they may lead us forward into the future you have for us. Revive them, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you would revive your church. We've appealed to you. We've called out to you. Because we know that when the church is revived, awakening can come to America. And we pray tonight for awakening, spiritual awakening, the next great awakening in the United States. And as we hear the challenge from God's word, May we know now is the time for awakening in America. Amen. I have read about revival and awakening. When God first called my family to Las Vegas, Nevada, somebody at our sending church, a little godly prayer warrior, a little Jewish lady who'd become a follower of Jesus, put a book in my hand about the Welch Revival and Evan Roberts. And I read with just fascination the story of a move of God in 1904 and 1905, where 100,000 people in Wales in one year came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It moved me so much that my wife and I, a year later, went and visited Wales. And I stood there in the pulpit where Evan Roberts preached in Lahore and just asked God to move like that again. 
I've read the story that you saw in the video about Jeremiah Lamphere and the Fulton Street Revival and the Third Great Awakening in the United States where over a million people came to know Jesus Christ. I've read about revival and awakening. I've heard about it. In our contemporary world, I hope you've heard that in China right now, 40,000 people a day are trusting Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. God is moving in China. We have, a, we have a Persian church planter on our team in Las Vegas that's going to plant a church to reach Persian-speaking peoples in, in the western United States. And he told me recently that 500 people a day are coming to know Jesus Christ in the country of Iran. 500 people a day. I've heard about revival. I've read about it. And I've heard about it. But I have never experienced that kind of an awakening where I live. And I don't know where you are tonight, but I am hungry to not just read about it and not just hear about it but to experience a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God on our nation like we have never witnessed before. And may God do that in such a way that no denomination or no church gets any credit, but may God move in such a way that we all have to step back and say, that is only a movement of a sovereign, holy God. But, but, but here's what I'm convinced of. We talk about it and we look out at our society and we say that the reason we're not having revival is in Washington or the reason that we're not having revival is in Hollywood or the reason that we're not having revival is in the inner cities of our country. But remember that the Word of God says, if my people will, then I will. The problem in America is not the lostness of America. The problem in America is the lack of desperation among the people of God. When we get desperate, in 1 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him about God's heart. He says, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He tells him about God's provision. That God, there is, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He tells him about God's plan. Paul says he's appointed me and others to be a, a, a spokesperson to tell this story. But, but here's what's interesting about all of that. that. That great description of the heart of God and the provision of God and the plan of God is sandwiched in between. Verse 1 and verse 8 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And both of them are exhortations to pray. I can't explain what I'm about to say. But I believe it to be true. God in His sovereignty has chosen to limit His activity to the prayers of His people. God didn't need to do it that way, but God in His sovereignty chose to do it that way. We need God in America. And until we get desperate for God, we will not see that move. Let's pray. To the moment over the next 30 minutes that we're not going to lose our focus we're going to be faithful all the way to the end and we're going to pray right now for the next great awakening in the united states you're going to hear cries out to god in all sorts of ways and i don't know what all this means but i, I really believe that there are several thousand of us tonight
Maybe it's not you, but several thousand of us who need to be on our face before God right now in agreement as these prayers are prayed. And maybe hundreds of us need to be right here in the front at the altar on our faces before God on this old hard concrete and cry out to God for our nation. So you get in the posture you want to get into. We're going to call out to God right now. And you agree in prayer with these tonight who will be calling out to God. Let's pray and let's call out to God tonight. God have mercy. We come in clear agreement asking that you bring us to unity, that the desperate need of the hour is a spiritual awakening. We've gathered the people, we've assembled the elders, and now we're crying out between the porch and the altar. Yes. God, that you would bring us together in unity, not one voice, but many voices in a chorus of one heart and one mind, that with one clear, unified cry, we are in desperate need of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Saturate us with your presence for the sake of Jesus. Send the Spirit in your people. Yes. Dear God, speak to us tonight, God. We cannot leave this place without the Holy Spirit's conviction. Lord, we cannot ignore the broken relationships. Lord, we cannot ignore the, the broken fellowship, even in our own bodies. Many of us go home to churches where there is fractured fellowship. God, send revival to us, and may we go from this place without being hypocrites, but may we take revival with us where we go to bring revival to this nation. Yes. Oh Lord, in this Kairos moment, we cry out for spiritual awakening. Let us repent and be revived by the power of God. Break us, Lord, like alabaster jars to be poured out, spreading the fragrant aroma of Christ in this nation and to the ends of the earth. We commit to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily, not in words, but in action. As the world grows ever darker, may your people arise, shine, for the glory of Jesus' name. Yes. Father, tonight we're asking you to break in in power, God. Tonight we're asking for one million souls in America to come to Christ in the next 12 months, God. Break in in power in our churches, in our cities, in our congregations, God. Let your word run swiftly and be glorified in Jesus' name. Yes. And Lord Jesus, tonight we come to you on behalf of 22 million college students represented across our nation. And Lord, I pray that these bastions of education, these places that are often known as sin would now be known for spiritual awakening. Yes. Just like Malik, I pray. Lord, I pray for one million college students to come to faith in Christ. We yes. pray it in faith. Amen. And dear God, I pray that you would fill church buildings up that are already built across this country where the gospel is being preached in rural communities and large cities. We've tried it on our own, Lord. It hasn't worked. We've done tricks, no help. We've been through tragedy, no results. So we trust you, God. 111 years ago, a coal miner turned preacher said, God, rain on wells. And Lord, for two years, the churches were filled. Tonight, Lord, this ex coal field worker prays with thousands of other believers, God, do it again. Fill us up with high tests. Yes. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. amen. Lord, we pray for thousands of churches to be planted across America. And Father, I pray there'll be thousands of men who will faithfully respond to your call to become pastors and church planters. Yeah. And Father, I ask that you would convict the hearts of our existing churches, pastors, and church leaders, that they would actively engage in the church planting process and provide the resources that are necessary and support that is necessary for this to become a reality. Amen. And then, Lord, we pray with confidence that these new churches would carry the message of Christ's love, mercy, and redemption, and that they would be a light that would shine in this dark nation and push back the darkness and may people see the light of Christ. Amen. Father God, we pray that thousands and thousands will be called from our churches, small yes. churches, large churches, to preach the gospel, yes. to have that call upon their life, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. 
May thousands and thousands be called to the mission field, to the toughest parts of this earth, Amen. the darkest places, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And may you provide the resources, Lord, for that to come about. We give this to you. Yes. God, you said in your word, ask and I will give you the nations. I will make the ends of the earth your possession. God, we are here tonight to ask. We're crying out that you would give us our neighborhoods. You would give us our counties, our cities, our communities, our nation and the nations, even to the ends of the earth. And then, Father, we will baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, Amen. and the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. May we see unprecedented baptisms as a result of the awakening that you're bringing yeah. in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we, in this moment, don't want this to be superficial. What good would it be to pray for an outpouring of your spirit and a great awakening if we walk in deliberate disobedience of the Great Commission by not making disciples? So, Father, as the gospel goes forth, as individuals make professions of faith, I pray that you would fill our hearts with an unceasing grief to see disciple-making become the normal reality for all of our churches and our world. Yeah. I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would allow us to instruct new converts in the Word until the point that we rise them up into leadership and we see spiritual maturity become the normal rhythm of churches all around the globe yeah. that are being obedient to the commission of making disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, amen. Father, we have talked about awakening, but we want to walk in an awakening. We want to walk in a fresh move of God, just like the days of the Jesus movement, God. I pray that showers will fall, that streams will converge, that yes. rivers will flow out of their banks, and in every county and community, city and state in this land, there would be an awakening that could not be held inside of any border. In the name of Jesus. Yes. King of Kings, we humble ourselves and petition you on behalf of our president, Barack Obama. We do this in obedience to your word. We ask your forgiveness for the hours we've spent complaining instead of praying. Yes. We ask now for his protection and the protection of his family. We ask, Father, that you would protect our that you would protect and direct our president. We believe yes. that you can turn his heart in your hand like streams of water. We pray that you direct his decisions according to your purpose and unto your glory. Lord, who is able to govern a nation like ours? We pray that you would give him a wise heart, a discerning heart, so that he can discern between good and evil. Yes. Amen. Father, we pray that you would give our leaders the fear of God and a hatred of sin and a fleeing from evil. We pray that you would break their hearts for the gospel and give them the wisdom of God that leads to salvation. We pray that our hearts would burn for Christ as we show the love of Christ to those that we disagree with. Yes. And so, Spirit of God, we pray that in a way that honors the Father through the Son, that you would move and bring glory to Jesus. Amen. Father God, I ask for your protection upon our sons, daughters, father, mother, who are around the, this earth and around the country protecting us for every airman, for every sailor, for every marine, for every Coast Guard member, for every soldier, for every National Guard member. Protect us, Lord, even for the ones that are for our wounded sol soldiers for our fallen, for their families. Protect us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Yes. Father God, precious Lord, I come before you to lift up our emergency services personnel, our first responders, the police, the fire, the paramedics. Lord, precious Lord, cover them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, fill them with your righteousness. Lord, burden the church that they would pray for these people who go out every day and witness a side of society that Lord no one should ever have yeah. to see Amen. precious Lord keep them safe keep them healthy Lord you are awesome in Jesus name Amen. Yes. Amen. God we want to thank you for tonight thank you for putting us on our knees 
We want to pray that we would always lead on our knees, make prayer a priority for the Southern Baptist Convention and for all of us. Protect the vulnerable, the weak, the lonely, the widow, the orphaned, and bring about spiritual awakening in places that will amaze us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we ask tonight, as we stand to our feet all over this auditorium, we ask in this worship tune tonight, heaven, would you hear our prayer? Let's worship him. As we call on your name, would you make this a place for your glory to dwell? Open the blind eyes, unlock the dead feet, come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven, touch our generation.
Thank you, Lord. We turn our attention now to 2.1 billion people in the world who have yet to hear about salvation in the name of Jesus. That's not a statistic. These are individuals who are made in the image of God, just like you and I are, who know what it's like to be lonely, know what it's like to feel fear, know what it's like to be in pain, for whom going to hell would be every bit the tragedy that it would be for you or me or our children. They are gathered into 6,400 unreached people groups, 3,700 of which are unengaged. Our Lord has promised that not one of the tribes and tongues will fail to be represented around his throne one day singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And we go because we believe that promise. And we pray because he commanded us to ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. The Lord's arm is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. It means that our God is no less compassionate today than he was when he looked down from the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's no less powerful today than when he said to Lazarus in the grave, Lazarus, come forth. It is our sin, Isaiah says, our sin that has separated us from the power of God. Psalm 126, the psalmist instructs us how to pray for global missions. Verse 4, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out with weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come with shouts of joy, bearing his sheaves, bringing his sheaves with him. Derek Kidner, the Old Testament scholar, says there are two different ways that the psalmist identifies God brings the harvest. Imagine a soil, he says, so arid that you have to plant each seed one by one and then water it with your tears. This is the normal hard work of evangelism. It's what missionaries do as they go out. They, it is painstaking. It takes prayer and faith and courage and patience. Kidner says, but there is another way. It is in verse 4, the streams of the Negev. The Negev was a desert region where occasionally there would be a torrential downpour. And in the space of a few days, there would be a lush green carpet of foliage where previously there had been a desert. And Kidner says, there is your other way when God opens up heaven and he accomplishes in a few moments what would take a lifetime to accomplish. Jonathan Edwards said, this is what happened in the Great Awakening. We were using the normal means of grace, preaching and praying and worshiping and confessing when God suddenly opened up heaven and began to pour out the streams of the Negev. It instructs us how to pray. We must never give up on the patience and the courage of the hard work of evangelism, but we must also never give up yearning that God can open up the streams of the Negev and he can do in a moment what would take us a lifetime to accomplish. Do you believe that our God can do that in our generation? His arm is not short and that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it can't hear. It is our sin of unbelief that has separated us from the power of God. The prophet Amos rebuked the people of Israel in his day with a, a somewhat of a strange rebuke. He said, do not seek me at Bethel or Gilgal or Beersheba. Three random cities to us, but to the Israelites, it represented three places where heaven had intersected with earth. Bethel, for example, is where God had appeared to Jacob. Gilgal and Beersheba had similar meaning to them. And God says, would you stop seeking me at Gilgal 
Bethel and Beersheba, seek me now and live. In other words, I'm not a God who moved yesterday. I'm a God who will move today and tomorrow. I'm not a God of the past. I'm a God of the present. I am a God of the future. We as Southern Baptists love to talk about the Great Awakenings. We love to talk about the early church. We love to talk about the Reformation. And it might be that God says to us, will you stop talking about the Reformation and about the early church and about the Great Awakening? Because I am not a God who just moved yesterday with 6,400 unreached people groups. I am a God who will move today. And the greatest works of our God based on the finished work of Christ are not behind us, they are ahead of us. It is our sin of unbelief that separates us from the compassion and the power of God. Let us bow our heads, let us pray, and let us believe that God will do the impossible today and that God will do it tomorrow. Folks, I want us to pray tonight. I'm gonna to ask some of these men on this stage tonight to voice one minute prayers about specific issues, and we agree together, one by one. Pastor J.D., would you ask God for a minute to give us a burden and a vision to reach the world for Christ? You preached it, pray it, and we will join you in agreement. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you looked out on the multitudes yes. and you were filled with compassion because they wandered as sheep with no shepherd. Mm. Lord Jesus, your heart has not changed. Yes. You are still not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm. And Father, we pray that your spirit right now might fill us with that vision, yes. might fill us with that passion, that he might take over, God, our paltry efforts, our five loaves and our two fish, and he might give us a vision for the bread of life in the hands of the multitude. We pray, God, that you would rend our hearts, God, with compassion for those, God, who are just like our children. God, people around the world for whom you have shed your blood to bring into your fold, God, you have sheep that are not yet part of this fold. And God, we pray that our hearts, God, that are mine, that is so consumed so quickly with yes. self-centeredness and materialism, God, would be would be replaced, God, with a heart that is like yours, that overflows with compassion, that, God, we would, we would weep and we would not be able to rest until we have seen, God, the completion of the Great Commission. Amen. God, take our small dreams and replace them with faith. Take our Amen. selfish ambitions and replace them with kingdom-extending goals. Take Amen. our self-glorification and replace it with a passion to see you glorified in every people group on earth as people yes. groups come to worship and proclaim that there is salvation found in no one else except for Jesus Christ, the name given to us by which we must be saved. Yes, amen. Ted Trader, would you come and pray? Pastor Ted, I want you to pray for one minute tonight.